discovery class. Hi, come on in. I've got a story for you today that I want you to sit through. Have you ever thought about Jesus' final walk? It was from Jericho to Jerusalem. Have you followed those steps? Have you stood in his shadow? Have you watched what he did? From the town of Bethany to the triumphal ride through the streets of Jerusalem. It's been called the world's greatest eight days. It began with triumph, went down into tragedy, and then back up into triumph again. From the Last Supper to the Garden, and from the Garden to the Trial, and from Pilate's Palace to Golgotha's Cross, we have watched Jesus walk. He's walked with anger. Do you remember when he went into the temple and he threw out the money changers? He's walked with weariness, tired. He hadn't slept when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane that night with his disciples. He walked with pain, carrying that cross, having lost all that blood after he had been whipped through the Via Dolorosa. He walked with power out of the empty tomb when he rose again. When you witness Jesus walk, has it made you think about your own walk? All of us have our own walk, you know. We've all had to do our walk, like Jesus did, to Jerusalem. Have you made your walk? Has your path been maybe a hollow religion? You've been looking for answers, but you can't find one. Maybe your path has been a divorce started well, but it didn't end that way. Maybe your path has been rejection. You thought you had some friends. Now you don't. Or has it been an accident in your life and you've been left crippled? You're not the same person that was born. Maybe your path has been you've been born into the finest family you could ever choose, but you've let them down. They're not what you think you were. Is your path a good education? You've gone to the best universities like the one sitting beside me, University of Calgary. But what have you done with it? Maybe your path is you lived in the finest country on earth, this land of Canada but you've never been satisfied. When Jesus walked his final walk from Jericho to Jerusalem, it was that walk that promised you and promised me a freedom that we could enjoy. It was also that walk that he promised that he was going to return and he was going to take us home. In his final walk from Pilate's palace to the hill of Calvary, you and I, we've walked together. Here's what he says to you on that walk as we walk beside him. It's actually found in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. That's my text today. The Son of Man did not come to be served Rather, he came to serve, and he came to serve others, and he gave his life as a ransom for many. I'm going to talk to you today about two stories. They both have to do with paths, paths that they walked. One was a man that walked a path for four miles. The other, his path wasn't so long, but it was very difficult. 
He had to walk from where he was across a, tr a town square. Now I want you to sit back, pour yourself another coffee or juice, and I want you to listen to these two stories. Shrikant Bola, 31 years old. He lives in India. He's the founding president and CAO of a company that today is worth 75 million bucks. His firm is a packaging company. It makes everything from egg cartons to appliance boxes. It hires a staff of over 500. And he ships his products all over the world. There isn't a country on earth that doesn't receive something from his factory. But the company that he owns nearly didn't happen. Do you want to know why? Because it was illegal for him, when he was a student, to study his two favorite subjects. Do you know what they were? Math and science. As a senior in high school, do you know what his problem was? He was blind. He was blind from birth. He had never seen a thing on this earth because he didn't have any eyesight. Every day, for two years, Srikan Bell walked four miles to his school. That's the path. It was in rural India. He was guided by his older brother who could see. The route was only a mud trail. It was lined with shrubs, which flooded during the monsoons. And he and his brother walked those four miles every day to his little class in their bare feet. He had no shoes. He said, no one talked to me because I was blind. I was born poor. My parents were both illiterate. He said, I was totally rejected by our community. My parents were put down and told that I couldn't even be a watchman in my own house because I couldn't see a stray dog if he came in the front door. Many people would say to my parents and ask them to murder me, put me out of my misery, put me to death. And it was done by parents by using a pillow, putting it over their body or over their face and suffocating them. That's what they wanted my mom and dad to do. They did that in our community with everybody that was born as a handicap. Kids that were Down syndrome sighted, those that had cerebral palsy, maybe blind like me. But he said, do you know what my blindness did for my mom and dad? They made me love me all the more. At the age of eight, his father said to him, I've got some exciting news, Srikan. You have been given a place in a boarding school for blind children, and I want you to go. He'd be moving to a city of Hyderabad, 249 miles from their house. The city was in the territory of Andhra Pradesh. It was a long way from his parents, but Shrikan was excited and he quickly settled in. And there he learned to swim. He learned to play chess. He even learned to play cricket because on the cricket ball, when they'd throw the pitch, it made a rattling sound so that he could hear it and he could swing his bat and hit it like a baseball. 
Then he started to worry. What about my future? He always dreamed of becoming an engineer. He just wanted to be an engineer. But he knew he needed to study science and he had to have math as a foundation or he couldn't get into engineering school. So when the time came for him to be selected for those crucial subjects, do you know what his school said to him? No, no. He was told that science and math were illegal. They were illegal subjects for blind students. No professor would take on a blind student and spend that extra time to show him calculus and math and science in order for him to graduate. And Indian schools and Andhra Pradesh were ruled by state boards. And his school was not permitted to teach science or math to blind students anywhere in the state. That was in the year 2007. One of his teachers, who really liked this young man, can't pronounce his name, I think it's Swarnalatha Kitalapati. He saw brilliance in this young Srikan. He knew of a mainstream school over in another state that didn't have rules like his own state. And they did offer science and math to blind students. And they had a place for him if he were interested. Well, sure he can. He happily enrolled. He was the only blind student in the class. But he was made welcome. And he was welcomed really with open arms. In six months, he rose to the top of his class. He loved his beloved math and science, and he really excelled. As a matter of fact, class, he averaged 98% on all his exams. Upon graduation, Srikan applied to the Indian prodigious engineering colleges all over the country of India. Do you know how many applications he sent out? Well, more importantly, who do you think received him? Not one. There wasn't a university in all of India that was interested in a blind student going on to becoming an engineer. He was turned down by every university. Not because of his grade. He had the highest grades. But because he was blind. Do you know what he did? He applied to the universities in the United States. Maybe somebody over here on this side of the Atlantic, maybe they would receive him. Five universities said they would take him. But do you know which one he chose? He chose the most revered engineering college in all of the United States. Do you know what that is? MIT. Massachusetts Institute for Technology down in Boston. It's a university right next to Harvard. In 2009, he became the first international blind student in their engineering program. Here he is. Picture it. New country, new school, new climate, never seen snow or cold before, new smells, New taste. He said for the first six months, all he ate was French fries and fried chicken fingers. He had never tasted them before. But Srikran adjusted and he thrilled. He said, my time at MIT was the loveliest period in my life. The academics were tough. They were gruesome. But he said, they had on the faculty in that university a disability service, and it was phenomenal. They took me under wing. And when I was learning university math and science, they taught me how to form a company. 
my own company. They trained and educated young disabled people just like me. They taught me how to open and operate a Braille library in my company so that people, if I hired them on and they were blind, I could teach them to read by their fingers, reading Braille. He taught me advanced management. Life went so well for Srikant that upon graduation from MIT, he was offered all kinds of jobs all over the United States. Do you know how many he took? Not one. He chose not to stay in the United States. He said, I've got unfinished business over there in my country. And when I left, my country is India. Listen to his own words. This is Srikan speaking now. I had to struggle so much for everything in life. Whereas not everybody can fight like I did. My dad helped me fight. My mother helped me fight. My brother helped me fight. Some families don't have anybody to help them fight. I had the best fighters. Looking at the bigger picture now, there's no point fighting for a fair education if there's no opportunity for disabled people to take it and afterwards. Then I got an idea. Why don't I start my own company? Why don't I employ people with disabilities, just like me? Shri Khan returned to Hyderabad in the year 2012, and he founded the Bolat Industries. Now remember, his last name was Bola. So he just put A&T, Boland Industries. That became the name of his company. It was a packaging manufacturing company that made corrugating packages for all kinds of things. They would even take fallen leaves from palm trees and turn it into packages. That's what he does. He manufactures that. The company today is valued at $75 million, has a staff, as I said before, 500 on staff, he hired his dad when he started the company. He hired his mom when he started the company. And he hired his young brother who helped him as, as a blind boy going to that first two years of school. Now he's got in his company, 36% of all of his employees are disabled. The treasurer and chief financial officer is blind. This year, Shrikan, 31 years of age, he was appointed onto the World's Economic Forum for Young Global Leaders. His shares are listed in all kinds of stock exchanges all over the world. Why did I tell you this? His journey was four miles in bare feet across a muddy path and he was blind. But he says, now I've got a new walk. I have found a brand new path and I have many that are following me that are walking beside me. Is that familiar to another walk that I just described? All right, I told you about the first young man who walked four miles. My next story in my second walk is a young man that walked across a town square. Here's his story. His name is Philip. His last name is Lazowski. He lives in Poland, in the town of Bialika. Philip and his family are both Jewish. Back in 1942, all the residents in his small village were rounded up and sent to a ghetto. And it was in Settle in the center of Poland, not far from Warsaw. One April morning in 1942, the Lazowski family, they caught wind that the Nazis were killing Jews in their ghetto. Young Philip, hearing this, he hid his father and his mother and his sister down in a cellar in the apartment where they lived. Every day he would go out and find enough food for them to eat. But on one day, 
even though he was careful. A Nazi soldier followed him and they watched him go into a house and shut the door. Well, the rest is history. The Nazis came into that house and they found that family and they marshaled them down to the town square in the ghetto. And not just them. On that particular day, they brought in 1,500 of their friends from all the other ghettos there in the town. The town marketplace, the soldiers split the families in two. Mums and dads and kids on this side, mums and dads and kids on this side. Those on this side that had papers that indicate they had value for the Nazi regime could be spared and they became slaves to the state. Those on this side that had no papers, they were shot cold blood that morning. There's a massacre in that marketplace of over a thousand Jews, mums, dads, kids. Philip was in this group. Seeing what was happening, he fled for his life. He ran through the crowd of bulls of being shot and he went over against the wall and he ran over to the other group on the other side. He didn't look back because he knew that his family was gone. So uh, Philip, he searched the crowd frantically on the other side and he saw a woman with documentations in her hand, standing there with two little girls at her side. She was a nurse. He didn't know she was a nurse. He didn't know what his papers were. He went over to her and as a little 11 year old boy, picture this, said to her, would you be kind enough to take me as your son? Can you imagine an 11-year-old saying that, knowing that his dad and mother and sister had just been bowed down across the corner? And he had taken a path that he didn't know where, through the crowd, over to this side, and there he stood and asked that question of that woman who was a nurse. Here's what she said. If they let me live with two children, Maybe they'll let me live with three. Hold on to my dress. Little Philip, hearing those words, reached up and clutched the dress of a lady named Miriam. Well, Philip Lazowski lived. The war ended. He just turned 16. He thanked the lady and he said, I must leave you because I can't stay. And he fled to Holland, worked his way onto a steamship, leaving for the United States. And there he made his way to his new country, into New York. Do you know what happened to Philip? He finished high school, he learned English, and he went to a synagogue and his rabbi said, with all your skills and all your background, why don't you become a rabbi? So he did. And he went to seminary and at a rabbinical school, he was ordained as a Jewish rabbi. As a young rabbi in his first synagogue, he had a wedding. And in the wedding, he was a guest at one of the tables, and when he was sitting at the table, they said to him, where did you come from? He said, I came from Poland. What was the name of your city? Bialyka, he said. Bialyka. Yes. I know a family that grew up in Bialyka. Oh, you do? Yeah, she was a nurse. She had two little girls. And the Nazis spared her. 
And Philip said, what was her name? Her name was Miriam. And then they went on to say, Miriam has always asked, is the little boy Philip that came to stay and live with me who became my son, is he still living? Out of that table, at that wedding, Philip was able to get the address and the location of Miriam, still back over there in Poland, working as a nurse. And Philip decided he'd make a journey back to say thanks. So he left the United States and went back to Poland, went to the little town, and there he found Miriam. And this is what he said to her. I've come to say thank you. You have saved my life. I saw my mother and dad and sister, they were massacred, and I fled across that town square. And I didn't know what I was doing or why I was there, but I ran into you. And do you remember what you said to me? If they don't kill me because I've got two daughters, why would they kill me if I've got another son? And you told me to hang on to your skirt. He said, I hung on to that skirt with all my might and main. And he said, I had no idea that you were going to save me. Do you know who was in the room that day with Philip and Miriam? Their oldest daughter, Ruth. Ruth. Do you know what happened out of that visit? Class, Philip fell in love with Ruth. Philip is now 91 years old, a retired rabbi. Ruth is his wife. They've been married forever. They've got three kids. they got seven grandkids. All because a young 11-year-old boy ran across a path of no man's land in the middle of a town square, having just probably lost all the life that he ever had in him, his mom and dad and his siblings. I conclude with this class. The Lord could see the hour that he would come into your life. He saw you blind, walking your way towards an education. He saw that. He saw that you were being denied, but he had a goal for you. He maybe had an MIT in his background and you are going to score that for your life. The Lord, he led you across a town square, even when you were a child and into tender belief. Little did you know that you were going to be adopted just because you were hanging onto the skirt of somebody you didn't know. Do you know the Lord knows all that? You could have been that child. You could have been a young Indian boy, blind. You could have been a long, young Jewish boy, running for his life. He loved you. Class, your walk in mine isn't over. The journey of your life isn't complete yet. There's one final walk that you're going to have to make. Jesus said, I'm coming back. And he proved it by ripping the temple curtain in two. And then he flung open the door of death. And he said, I'm going to come back. The one who has redeemed us has returned. Your last journey isn't your end. You're going to take a seat at a feast. And you're going to hear him say to you, well done, faithful servant. Welcome home. Class, I'm going to look for you at the table. Because I want you there with me. I'm going to conclude my class today with my February birthdays. Here are all the birthdays for all of you rascals that are in my class for this month. On the second, Gottfried Schaum. On the third, Sherry Dubber. On the sixth, Loa Cosmo. On the seventh, Renny Bly. On the 15th, Ruth Hunt. On the 16th, Julie Rachel. On the 19th, Yvonne Kerr. 
On the 24th, Gene Cocott. On the 24th, me, Kernahan. And there's one anniversary, Jake and Betty Sayre. Class, let me leave you something from the sunny side of the street. I was born in a tiny town way back there in Ontario, February 25, 1940. I'm an old man. You're looking at one of the Sphinx. An oil baron in the little town of Petrolia where I was born, he donated a big mansion house because oil was discovered there. Didn't last long, it was only down shallow in the ground. But he, he, he gave this to the town as a gift to a little hospital. Well, it was in that place. It turned out is where I was born. Now, in that little town, they had a law at the turn of the century, 100 years ago, that has been there forever. And do you know what the law says? You can do anything you want on Saturday night on Main Street after 10 o'clock. Just don't scare the horses. That's enough for today, class. Time is gone. I'll look for you next week. Thanks for dropping by.